So um, my name again is Katie Wendt. I am a postdoc here at Oregon State University in Corvallis, and I am on the hunt for these things. These are called cryogenic cave calcites or CCCs, um, which my colleague Yuri is sampling here. And in this talk, I'll go into detail about what they are and how they form and what they might be able to tell us about the climate history of a particular region. But before I do, I wanted to give a quick overview on my research field. So as Daryl mentioned, I am a paleoclimatologist. And what that means in plain speak is that I study the Earth's climate history I spend a lot of my time thinking about what Earth's climate conditions were like during the last ice age. So here's a map showing changes in surface air temperatures during the last glacial maximum, which was about 20,000 years ago. And this map only shows changes in temperatures, but of course there were a whole lot of other changes happening in the ocean atmospheric system during this time. Changes in sea level and ocean circulation and changes in vegetation and precipitation amount, a whole lot of things to study. And my research was uh, specifically looking at changes in the North American continent during the last ice age. So it turns out if you place a huge ice sheet on North America, a lot of crazy things happen. So for example, today in the Pacific Northwest, we receive a lot of rainfall in the wintertime. And that's because we're getting all of this rain from winter storms that are blowing inland from the Pacific along what's called the Pacific Storm Track. And during the Ice Age, um, evidence suggests that the Pacific Storm Track shifted south so that all of the rain that we receive um, today was actually funneled into the Southwest um, United States during the last ice age. So areas like the Great Basin, for example, uh, were completely covered in lakes and rivers and streams. In fact, if you've ever been to the Badwater Basin in Death Valley National Park, um, you were actually standing at the bottom of a large glacial lake known as Lake Manly. And so one question I get a lot is how do scientists know all this? How do scientists know what the temperature was like during the last ice age, for example? And the answer to that question is something called environmental proxies. So this is a snapshot from a really cool website, which is posted here. I highly recommend checking it out. It's interactive and really cool. And it lists all of the paleoclimate uh, studies that have been published, um, categorized by the different environmental proxies. So ice cores are a really famous one. A lot of people associate paleoclimate with ice cores. If you drill an ice core in Greenland or Antarctica, you get something that looks a little like this. This has a ton of tiny little bubbles, uh, which are essentially frozen um, atmosphere um, or frozen ancient atmosphere. And what we can do and what we do do here at OSU is we can extract that ancient atmosphere, that ancient air, um, and then um, measure the chemical composition. So we can basically discern um, what the CO2 concentrations were during the last ice age, for example, or what other kind of greenhouse gas concentrations were in the past relative to today. Another cool proxy is uh, corals. So corals tell us a lot about sea level changes in the past. You can also drill into a living coral and take a look at its growth layers. And that'll tell you about changes in ocean salinity and water temperature changes, for example. Lake sediments are also a big one. So um, sediments are deposited in lakes um, and these sediments create layers which build up year after year. So if you core into a lake, you might get something that looks a little bit like this. And the deeper you core, sort of the deeper you are, you're going back in time. Um, and you can learn a lot from these sediments. Again, changes in um, water chemistry, changes in lake levels. Um, you can also take a look at some of the pollen grains that are trapped in these sediments and do some um, past vegetation assemblages, for example, a lot of really cool stuff. But last but not least is speleothems. And this is what I'm most interested in and do most of my research in. So 
cave deposits like the one you see here are a little bit like time capsules. This is a stalagmite that has been sliced kind of lengthwise and it's been, been polished. And so what you're looking at here are the individual calcite layers that have been deposited year after year from the dripping action um, within a cave. And we can analyze the chemical composition of these layers in order to understand past changes in temperature at the surface, past changes in precipitation or rainfall. I don't see a screen share. Oh, a screen share. Can that other people see my slides? <laughs> yeah, I can see it. Yeah, yeah, no problem with that. Okay. Oh, you're That's good. Fine. Okay. I've been able to see it the whole time, so. <laughs> okay, you have. Great. Okay. <laughs> That's the problem with Zoom. You never know if all of a sudden totally, you know, everything's off the grid. Okay, cool. I'll keep going. Also, by the way, if people have questions or, you know, if something wonky is going on, just, you know, feel free to let me know. So. <clears throat> oh, Katie. Right. Yeah. Um, I was just going to shout out to everyone and say, if you have questions as we go, just type them in the chat box. And when she's done, we'll read them out and uh, we'll do it that way. Okay. Thanks. That's a good idea to keep us on time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and time is relative in this meeting. We're happy to have okay. a program and, and uh, this is exciting, I think, for a lot of us. So thank you. Take your time. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so just a little bit more about my specialty, what I research. I did my master's at the University of Minnesota studying uranium thorium dating of cave carbonates. Um, and the theory behind uranium thorium dating is actually pretty simple. So um, we all know that the element uranium is radioactive. And so over time, it decays to a series of intermediate daughters until it finally reaches lead, which is stable. And one of these intermediate daughters is thorium. And so what we can do is measure the concentration of thorium atoms and uranium atoms in a stalagmite. And by looking at the ratio of those two, and since we know the decay rate of uranium to thorium really, really well, we can essentially calculate the time when that calcite layer was deposited. And we can do that up to about 600,000 years, roughly. Um, which is a really great uh, span of time. It's, it's larger than uh, radiocarbon dating, for example, which only goes back to about 45,000 years. During my PhD, I did some research on the climate history of the Southwest of Southwest Nevada during the last three ice ages. I was working um, in the Armagosa Desert um, in a cave called Devil's Hole II. Um, Devil's Hole 2 is special because it is coated in these subaqueously deposited speleothems. Subaqueous meaning that they were deposited underwater. And so because we can see these unique calcite layers um, high above today's water table, which is shown here, we know that sometime in the past the water table much, must have been much higher. Um, and so what we can do is reconstruct like hydrographs of the past. Um, so this is just a graph showing sort of some of our results. Um, and I won't go into detail and I won't really, you know, dive into the science behind all of this, but I just wanted to show as an example that on the y-axis we have water table height in meters relative to today. So zero meaning today. And then on the x-axis, we're going back in time in thousands of years before present day. So again, zero is present day and 350 is 350,000 years ago. And we can look to and see how the water table has fluctuated in this cave over a very long period of time. And this tells us a little bit about how climate changed. So I'm happy to speak more about this work, maybe in like a different talk or something like that, but I wanted to move on to my sort of harebrained idea that I have for the future. So um, this is it. <laughs> I have a lot that I still have to learn about. Um, hopefully, you know, if you guys have questions, I'll be able to answer them. I might not be able to answer all of them at this time. Um, but I'm also really excited to talk to you guys to get sort of your ideas and thoughts about the feasibility of this project, let's say. 
So <clears throat> here's a map again of the US uh, 20,000 years ago or so during the last glacial maximum. And we can see in gray, I kind of lost my cursor, we can see in gray the extent or the southern limit of the Laurentide ice sheet. <clears throat> And then in this sort of striped area, we see the speculative limit of past permafrost, um, again, during the maximum extent of the last ice age. And speculative is a big word because scientists don't actually know how far south permafrost reached in the state of uh, Washington um, in the past. That's a huge unknown that um, we'd, we'd really like to figure out because it tells us a lot about, again, the dynamics of permafrost over time. And so the reason why we don't know is there's just not a lot of proxies out there that tell us about paleopermafrost or past permafrost. And there's even fewer proxies out there that we can date really precisely using radiometric methods like the one that I mentioned, uranium thorium dating. But there is one exception, and that is cryogenic cave calcites. So CCCs, as we like to call them, are these very small formations. Here's a scale bar for reference. Um, and they precipitate uh, via cryogenic processes, which I will get into detail later. What's cool is that scientists have only really discovered that CCCs could be used as a proxy for past permafrost um, in the early 2010s. So this is like super, super recent stuff. Here's a picture of some CCCs in Austria. Um, they're often scattered on boulders or on the ground or in kind of like dried up pools in a cave. Um, they're really, really small again, as you can see. Here's another photo of them um, with a scale bar off to the right here. <clears throat> and because they're so small, they're really easy to overlook when you're in a cave. Um, I often relate them to mushroom hunting in a forest. Like when, you've, when you go out and you're looking for mushrooms for the first time, you might not see them right away, but you kind of have to like adjust your eyes. And before you know it, you just see them everywhere. Um, that's the same with CCCs. When I've been caving in Europe, for example, at first you don't see them at all. And then you're, and, and it's also kind of dark. And then after a while your eyes adjust and they're just everywhere. That's really cool. Here they are um, in England. Um, this is my friend, Paul, who is studying them. He's actually doing his PhD on cryogenic cave calcites. Um, they're loose. They're just scattered all over the ground, like I said, or on a boulder. They're not cemented to anything. Um, so they're really easy to pick up and sample. Um, it's also really great proxy for cave preservation purposes because you just really need one or two to do our dating analyses. Um, and so it still pres preserves the beauty of the cave and um, someone looking in this area wouldn't even know that they'd be missing because they're so small, one or two of them. They come in a huge variety of different shapes and different sizes. So here's a photo of some of the more common shapes that I've seen at least in the field. Here's a picture of um, what they could look like. Um, there's also some debate of whether or not some of these formations were formed uh, cryogenically, um, but you know, there seems to be a whole lot of different, at least, you know, shapes and colors that are associated with these CCCs. So again, the common denominator between all of these um, formations is that they were formed uh, via a process called uh, freezing-induced supersaturation. And I'll go through that pretty quickly. The concept is actually pretty easy to grasp. If you imagine a pool of water in a cave, um, like uh, shown here, sort of represented here by this box. Um, this water has a bunch of calcium and bicarbonate ions floating around in it because we're in a limestone cave in our uh, pretend scenario. And the saturation index of the calcium carbonate in this water is shown here, just for anyone in the audience who happens to be a chemist or a geologist and likes to know these things. So, 
In our imaginary cave, let's now imagine that over several centuries, um, temperatures begin to drop so that this pool of water slowly begins to freeze. And over time, these ions um, enjoy or prefer to be in the uh, liquid state. They don't like freezing into ice. So as our pool slowly freezes, these ions become more and more saturated. The saturation index increases to the point that they actually precipitate as a CCC. And then over time, they aggregate and they create these funky formations that we see today. And so here's an example of a picture of what we think are like modern forming CCCs. So this is taken, a photo taken in a cave uh, called Winter Wonderland Cave, which is in the Utah uh, mountains of Utah. Uh, I've never been there and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, the cave has perennial ice, which you can see here. And the CCCs that were discovered were just sort of scattered on top of the ice, almost dust-like. And again, these guys precipitated from thin layers of ice, uh, sorry, water that formed on the pre-existing ice. Um, and so that's an example of sort of CCCs forming in situ or modern day, under modern day conditions. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in fossil CCCs. So going into a cave where we don't see any ice at all, but CCCs are everywhere. That's really interesting to me because that tells us a little bit about the climate history of that particular region. And that ice must have been in the cave in the past. So um, how exactly did CCCs form in the past? What are some of the kind of physical or environmental processes that could have taken place um, for CCCs to precipitate? That question is a huge question and something that's being sort of debated in the scientific literature today. But what I'm going to present to you, um, hopefully quickly, I realize I'm running short on time, um, is sort of our best guess of how they formed. Um, and then after that, I'm just going to show you one last map and then I'll be done with my talk just to give you a heads up. So. Under glacial conditions um, in an area of the world that would be covered in permafrost, um, you might get a cave that looks a little bit like this cartoon that you see here. Because the permafrost table has essentially kind of frozen the cave in the ground, it is um, hydrologically inactive. There's no dripping water, there's no flowing water in the cave. And so speleothems do not grow during these glacial conditions. As we move towards a deglaciation, meaning that we are melting out of an ice age, temperatures begin to warm, permafrost begins to dethaw or decay, and the permafrost table begins to um, recede down um, and into the ground. And so eventually that table will hit the cave ceiling and, and water can begin to infiltrate into the cave. But because the cave is still below zero, so it's still uh, below freezing in temperature, that water that infiltrates in freezes, and during that freezing process, CCCs form. So here's our kind of imaginary water pools, and here are CCCs that are forming during this permafrost degradation. <clears throat> Okay, so then further warming continues as we're sort of moving into a warmer interval, moving into this interglacial. Um, and uh, ice continues to persist in the cave and CCCs just sort of hang out on top of the ice. And then eventually we hit an interglacial period like the one we're living in today. Um, water can infiltrate into the cave. It becomes hydrologically active. There's dripping going on and there's um, stalagmites and stalactites that are forming again. And again, I keep using the word cave, but of course we're only talking about limestone caves. I know that in Washington, there's a lot of other types of caves, but specifically talking about limestone here. Okay, so I think I might, um, yeah, I think I'm just gonna go forward a little bit longer and then certainly stop me if it starts to get too much, but- You're fine um, if- 
Um, okay. Katie, uh, Matt, Matt and Steve both begged me to give uh, floor time to them. And I'm joking because they're both friends of mine. So um, you're, okay. I think you're fine. So take your time. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I probably only have maybe like five or some more minutes left, but. Yeah, sure, okay, no problem. So where have CCCs been discovered thus far? They've been discovered um, first in Europe. Um, when I was doing my PhD there, they were like first being discovered and it was all very exciting. Um, and then they've also been studied in England and then also um, in Russia. CCCs weren't discovered in the US until 2018. And the very first paper was published about CCCs in the Western hemisphere just this year. So again, this is like brand new for scientists. We're really starting to um, get smart to the idea of what CCCs represent and what they can tell us about past climate. So I was going to briefly talk about sort of a case study of CCCs that were um, uh, researched in the Ural Mountains in Russia. <clears throat> so the cave um, that my colleagues visited was in the southern foothills of the Ural Mountains. Um, and there we go. Uh, so today the Ural Mountains are completely permafrost free. During the last ice age, um, the Eurasian ice sheet probably reached to about 60 degrees north, which is sort of here if you can see my cursor. I'll just do it over here again. Yeah, here, if you can see my cursor, uh, the ice sheet reached to about this latitude. And so it's thought that um, the Ural Mountains, of course, weren't covered in an ice sheet, but there may have been sort of either continuous or discontinuous permafrost during the last ice age, but it's all sort of up in the air as far as what extent and when it was. So the cave that they visited was called Shulgan Tash Cave um, in Russia. It has a Wikipedia page. So um, if you want to learn more about the geology or see some pictures or read about the environment of this region, feel free to uh, Google it. Uh, Shulgan Tash Cave is famous for these cave paintings. Um, my colleague Yuri is shown here. He was invited by the folks who work for the uh, Parks Nature Reserve in order to try and date uh, when these cave paintings um, were painted. Um, the cave is home to over 200 ancient paintings, many of which feature woolly mammoths, which you can kind of see here. Um, the paintings were made out of red ochre and that red ochre, so that paint material can be dated using radiocarbon dating, but then also uh, we can date the calcite crusts or sort of the flow stones that are growing on top of the cave paintings. And that gives us sort of like a younger limit age to when the paintings could have been um, made. So here's a picture of my colleague Yuri very carefully sampling those calcite crusts in order to get an age. Um, and he gets this age um, back at the University of Minnesota where I did my master's degree. And while he was sampling these crusts, he also noticed a ton of CCCs in the cave. So in addition to sampling the uh, flowstone on the walls, he also sampled some of these CCCs, um, as well as some of the stalagmites in the area in order to get a better understanding of the climate history of this region. So this is sort of my last slide. These are the results of this study that I'll summarize very, very briefly. If you're interested in this, you can certainly um, read about it in much more detail in the actual publication. So, Let's first review where we are in um, Earth's climate history. So today is uh, represented by zero, which my cursor can't make to. Yeah, today is represented by zero here, and then we're going back in time in thousands of years before present. So 60 is, of course, 60,000 years. Um, uh, from about 15,000 years ago um, back, uh, we were uh, Earth was in uh, the last ice age, the last glaciation, and conditions were very cold. The deglaciation or the melting of the last ice age happened around here, represented by that yellow bar. And then the Holocene, which is the interglacial that we live in today, where conditions are much warmer, is represented by this red bar. 
So he was able to uh, perform uranium thorium ages on a number of stalagmites as well as flowstones that are covering those cave paintings in order to understand when the cave was still hydrologically active in the past. The cave paintings were also um, uh, uh, dated. Um, so they're about, um, well, that old as designated by the red bar which is um, surprisingly old actually. Um, and it makes sense why the, the artists were painting woolly mammoths um, during that time, um, because the cave was no longer hydrologically active. They had a kind of a dry canvas, they could paint on it um, and conditions were really cold. So it was sort of like they were painting inside of a freezer or something. Um, and so, uh, that's really cool. And then also they dated, or Yuri dated the CCCs. So again, these CCCs are telling us a story about when permafrost in this area was thawing and refreezing. And I should mention that the last ice age wasn't just one big long cold period. There were actually sort of like natural fluctuations in temperatures over time. And so these CCCs tell us a little bit about when permafrost may have um, extended and then decayed away uh, throughout the last glaciation. Okay, so this is my very final slide. So this brings me all back to the reason why I wanted to talk to you guys today is that the state of Washington, uh, based, on of its, based on its climate history, um, should be a prime candidate for CCCs and finding CCCs. Of course, they have to be they, they are only, they're only precipitated, they're only formed in limestone caves. And I know Washington doesn't have a lot of limestone, but um, there are a few caves, right? Um, from what I've read from your guys' newsletters, which have been very educational for me, there's um, Gardner Cave and then um, Albright Cave, I guess I was also reading about. Um, and these caves are located in an area where if you can imagine, again, the continental ice sheet, melting away during the end of an ice uh, age. Um, it's sort of like uh, receding further, further north. And along with it is the southern extent of the permafrost zone. And so um, theoretically, there should be a time when this area of Washington was covered in permafrost and then that permafrost decayed away. Um, and so, I would bet money that there are CCCs out there and we just have to find them. And so, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, uh, if you see CCCs in the field, that would be so cool to take a picture <laughs> and, and send it to me. Um, email, uh, text or call me. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about it. Maybe you've seen them already before and you were wondering what they were. Um, yeah, I, I would love to do a little bit more caving in Washington, maybe this summer or next summer, and then eventually put together a research proposal at the end of, you know, 2022. And then this project wouldn't start until 2023. But I first need to kind of prove that they actually exist. And so um, that's where I I'd very much appreciate your guys's input and help in looking for them. Katie, thanks so much. Um, we've got a bunch of questions. So if you don't mind, I will just read them to you. And uh, yeah, great. I can't see them. So that's great if you read them to me. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm for once useful in a technological sense uh, when I'm on the spot. So Will Jasper asks, uh, what's the precision of the U234 TH230 dating? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uranium thorium dating, it, can, we, we can get up to essentially two per mil precision relative uncertainty, if that means anything. So um, let's see. So as an example, maybe 40,000 years ago, we can um, date up to um, plus or minus maybe like 50,000 years. Um, so we can get ages that are really, really precise. However, the reason why I'm sort of wishy-washy in all of this is because it, it requires finding the right sample um, because oftentimes we get cave samples that have a lot of detrital material, and then we have to sort of correct for that detrital material, and it gets really uh, messy, and the age uncertainty gets larger and larger and larger. But under really great conditions, we can go back to two per mil relative uncertainty. 
Okay, um, Cora McKenzie asks, how do CCCs vary based on area, like appearance, appearance, composition, et cetera? Are there giveaways to know which continent or cave system they came from? Yeah, to my understanding, no. They, they seem to be very varied all over the map. There isn't like an English CCC versus a European CCC. Um, again, I'm sort of new to this deposit. I've seen it in the field a few times, but um, I definitely need to dive further into the literature and take a look at more photos. But from the people that I've talked to, no, there isn't sort of like a spatial, um, you know, diversity of different shapes and sizes based off of where you are. Um, Kat Greaser asks, um, is there an easy way to tell the difference between potential CCCs on small pieces of flowstone or other cave decorations that have flaked off and are also loose? Yeah, right. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, and uh, that's something that I really need to talk to my friend Paul that I took, a, uh, I, I showed the photo of him. Um, he, I remember when I had a conversation with him about these before he said that, yes, you can. Um, and I just, at the moment, can't remember how exactly. <laughs> but uh, I guess the way that we would do it is if you were to see something that may look like a CCC, take a picture. Um, if I get the right sort of um, permission from like if it's a cave that's protected from the state or run by the state, um, like Gardner Cave, um, I would get permissions and then I would take a little sample and then I bring it back to the lab and I look under it under a microscope and then I talk to my friend Paul, who's an expert in these things and then ask him <laughs> basically. Okay. Um... Let's see, I have a question for you and okay, how has there been much research done as far as like the actual extent of, of the uh, maximum permafrost in Western Washington and more specifically, and uh, Carl Goldscheider talked about this, has a question, Windy Creek Cave, do, do we know if it extended north or south of Mount Baker? Okay, so this is where um, you guys actually might need to help me. Again, I'm totally new to the Pacific Northwest and also the geography of the state of Washington. Um, and so, um, I, yeah, I, I don't really know where Mount Baker is. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, can you show us the can map, show us map, map that's just of Washington? Sorry, what? Oh, um, I think you had a slide that was just of Washington. Oh, sure, yeah, I can show you. So the reason this is important to a lot of us on the call is because mm -hmm. uh, Windy Creek Cave is the longest limestone cave in Washington, longest known limestone cave at uh, around 3,100 feet. And it's probably, well, based on that, it's it's fairly close, it might qualify. So we, we are actually arranging trips that we're gonna talk to or talk about later in this meeting. Um, but that's a limestone cave that a few people on this call might actually have experience uh, with knowing if there's anything that might uh, be what you're looking for. Okay, yeah. So Kathleen, Mount Baker is uh, uh, very north of the Cascade. It's uh, northeast of Bellingham, so it's okay. pretty close to the Canadian border. That's okay. Okay, great. I'll look it up. <laughs> Yeah, again, I apologize. I, I moved here in January, so I'm like really new. Um, I grew up in Minnesota um, and then moved to Austria and then moved straight here. So I appreciate the tips. Oh, or, uh, it makes us doubly excited. Van, <laughs> your yeah. question. It looks like Windy Creek would definitely be included in that blue area and some of the others, other caves up there too, and, and some farther north. You mentioned Gardner, which would be up in the opposite corner. Um, the problem with that is it's a tourist cave, so it's probably got a lot of tourist debris in it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, off in the off tourist area, it's very well washed. I mean, it gets a lot of water. So I don't know if there'd be any way to, to find it if there's still mm -hmm. a lot of water pouring in there. Mm -hmm. There's a, a dry cave in the middle of the state. I can't remember the, the name of it. I've been there that also may be within that blue area. 
what does anybody remember the name of that cave that's up by Okanagan? Uh, Albright Cave. Yeah, yeah, that would be within that area too, and it's dry, so maybe there'd be something there. I've been there, but I wasn't looking for that. The only thing I noticed there was a whole bunch of rat droppings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a privately owned cave, is that right? From what I um, read. I don't know if it's privately owned. If anybody can go there, I mean, I went there without asking permission. And, uh, one, I know other people. Yeah. Are there. Oh, I'm going to censor Van's comment in the official record. Yeah, Albright Albright Cave is uh, on BLM land. Okay. But uh, all the access is through private land. Yeah, but I there there weren't any gates. There are no gates. It's, I was there. I was there last summer, um, but I there's flowstone, but I don't think there's any um, any other formations. Yeah, it's not a decorated cave. It's it's not very interesting, <laughs> but it might have CCCs. Mm -hmm. um, I've got one final question for you, Katie. Um, mm -hmm. Have you considered submitting an article about your research to the NFS News? Oh, <laughs> to put you on the spot. No. So that, <laughs> that you don't need great. to answer that question. But um, in my opinion, and probably about twenty or thirty people on the call, uh, opinion, I this would be an excellent uh, idea and project to to publish to the NFS News and the kind of stuff that people like me and a lot of people here. Uh, love to hear about and love to think about. And if you're giving us a scavenger hunt, I mean, how fun is that? We like to go caving anyway. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll look into that. I also know that there's the Nas uh, National Conference. Um, is it in June? I guess maybe people will be talking about that later in Weed, California. So yeah, that's uh, our next speaker. And we're actually, okay. I guess we Great. should uh, respect them. So and, I can uh, come with some CCCs in mind or in oh. hand. So I'll do that. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop my screen share. Uh, I and thanks, everyone.